Good evening, dear people. It's 7 o'clock, and we're going to get started with our, our prayer meeting hour. If you give me your own amount of attention, I would appreciate it. I don't anticipate staying very long tonight. I'm a little under the weather, so we're just going to kind of hit and miss. And we're going to have our prayer time. We will have our Bible study. We'll finish up chapter 16. Uh, but other than that, that's probably all we're going to do tonight. We're going to begin our service with any praise reports. Does anybody have a praise report? Shelly, okay now. Shelly, my daughter? Yes. She's okay now. Wonderful. Wonderful. That is great news. We're glad to hear that. That is great news. I had asked for prayer for my friend Nancy Cohen, and she's doing better off. Oh, God. Praise the Lord. I love all those praises. Amen. 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 Lest I forget it, I did not. Yeah, wait a minute. I need you to sign that card for you leave here tonight, okay? Please. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Goodness, his mercy, his rain, he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Now, I know he sends it on the unjust because he sent it in my house. <laughs> we are blessed to have a little bit of rain. We need to pray for some several people. Uh, there's a lot of people who have dealt with COVID and they have survived and everything is getting along. And as you see, if you follow it like I do on, on the news networks, the, the number is going down, the hospitalization is decreasing. And uh, what they're attributing it to is everybody is practicing safe distancing. Now, our war we did it, really get back to the days of hugging and shaking hands and all that. That might be gone forever. We don't know. Now, if you live in Russia, there's a vaccine over there. If you want to go over there and get some. So, but anyway, I, I'm encouraged by everything, and I'm looking forward to the things that are going to transpire in our church in the coming days. We want to mention our uh, August uh, project. We are collecting canned goods from the Samaritan House. If you have any interest in that or questions, just uh, direct them to Miss Felicia Porch. And uh, then, if you are helping with the school supplies, Judy, do you have any announcement to make about, about that, or you just want us to continue to bring all kinds of school supplies that you bought? It's a flyer being posted around now. All right, now. It's not just school supplies, it's also money for gift cards, toiletry items, white tube socks, towels, and washcloths. Well, people on the internet cannot hear a word that, because I know, because I can. So, <laughs> <laughs> tell well, me. I posted it to Facebook, so they should be able to see my post. Okay, just look at Judy Monroe's Facebook page, and you'll be able to see the supplies that I were. GAs, not GAs. C.A.s. Mm -hmm. C.A.s. Children in Action are collecting, and uh, that will go through August also. Mainly school supplies and a lot of other things also. And they'll be shipped out to a home missionary, okay? Uh, things that are going on in September. We're still anticipating having a, a homecoming. We're also anticipating having our uh, uh, NAS walk. Now, we had an advisory board meeting Monday night. As of right now, the meeting of the walk is not going to be held at the gardens. We're going to divide that up, and I think every group that sponsors uh, or has sponsors will be walking at a certain area. So hmm. stay tuned for that. Don't plan on just showing up at the, at the gardens on the 10, at 10 o'clock on the 19th, okay? I'll give you information on that as things transpire. We may end up walking here. We just don't know right yet. But the way that Joy and Yarborough talk, we will not be meeting at the gardens, okay? I think the governor has limited our meetings to 250 people. I don't remember exactly how many we bring out, but it's usually more than that. And so we will be walking in a different area. But that does not mean that you cannot participate. Continue to contribute money. Give it to Ms. Daphne back there that we can reach our goal. We're coming along pretty good. And I'm also glad to tell you that uh, things are real good as far as dad's contributions, okay? Um, uh, uh, sponsors have been real good, and so that's good too. So anyway, that's that news. Uh, yes, ma'am. I 
I'd like for y'all to remember the family of my uncle Roy Fields and also his wife, Aunt Georgia, had COVID, but hers affected her muscles. And uh, his, of course, affected his lungs, and he passed away this afternoon. But hers is not life threatening. It's just extremely painful. Yes, uh, those news, those things are encouraging of people that have had it uh, or survived it. You know, so that's good news. We remember that. I also need to let you know that because of the cards they were posted pre-COVID, we are going to plan on Sunday school on that Sunday morning for homecoming at 9.30. Now we'll have to work out the logistics because the singing group will be here setting up. Maybe they can set up a little early and then oh, Yes, ma'am. On the calendars, I have the day I walk at the garden, so scratch that, and I also have no Sunday school, so y'all have to scratch that and put your Sunday school. We yeah, have Sunday good. school, homecoming Sunday at 9 30, okay? And then worship begins at 10 30. You want to move it up a half hour, or however you want to work it. We will be beginning our Sunday school back in the first of September. That's a couple of weeks away. Um, but Adults will be meeting out here, children will be meeting downstairs in Lane Hall, and then the preschool will be the nursery will be meeting in the regular rooms. Okay? Any questions on that? All right, let's go on to our prayer list. Uh, yes, sir. Remember my niece's husband, uh, Roger Bennett? He fell a while back and did something to his chest, that's all I can say. But he thinks he messed up his foot, too. Give me that first name. Roger. Roger Bennett. Bennett. Okay. Doris Bennett. Okay. My niece is husband. Employed. Okay. Anybody else has a prayer request? Judy. My friend Jackie Riley Coleman has cancer. She's going through chemo. Jackie Owens? Coleman. Coleman. The names that we have, please continue to remember Tommy Sue. If you want her phone number, all you have to do is ask. I'll be glad to share that with you and you can call and talk to her. Katie Diamond asked for special prayer. She's sick. Uh, Bud Henson, continue to remember him. Joe Burrell, Miss Linda Hooker. Had a lengthy conversation with Linda. Uh, she's taken her first round of chemo, but she's lost over 50 pounds. Now, she didn't have all that to lose. She doesn't eat much, so I don't know if you can do anything for her by food. She just eating knickknacks and snacks. Uh, but she's continuing with her treatment. So remember her in your prayers that the Lord will continue to bless her. Remember Doc's aunt and uncle, Mr. Roger Bennett, Mr. Jackie Cole, Miss Jackie Cole, I'm sorry. Any other names? Daphne? Um, Camille, one of my twins, Camille's um, on her. 12-year checkup, they heard just a soft murmur on her heart, so she uh -huh. had an echo tomorrow. We're going for that tomorrow morning. They just pray for Say the last name again. Camille Goodwin. Good. My twin. My twin daughter. <laughs> How do you spell Camille? C-A-M-I-L-L-E. I didn't know you were talking about your daughter. I was talking about that. <laughs> it's okay. Not always with it. Best time on the night. Your wife cracks her feet together. And Diane Staley. Yeah, I mentioned her first name. I did. Diane Staley, right there. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. First name. I didn't hear you. That's all right. I understand. <laughs> You, you, you like me, you're going up there in the years too. And she's a cook in the plan too. How <laughs> come y'all sit way toward the back? Because you spit too far. <laughs>
um, she and I both were trying to stay in during this time of yeah. COVID. Yeah, well, I know I hadn't seen them in a while, so. Yeah. And she said Donald's doing the same thing. They both stayed in. Of course, that probably knows more about it, too. But believe it or not, I have had members that have told me, I'll see you next year. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I don't fault those people, not at all, because I understand. I understand. Let's have a prayer. We're going to start down here, just a sentence prayer. And Doc, I'm going to ask you to close it. And uh, remember the name that we've called. Okay. I was very Father. We praise you all the names of the next one. tonight that you will continue to give me strength help me to be strong in my faith and to always remember that you're there for me and um, to never fall from protection of love from anyone greater than you Lord and I just thank you for that and I pray that you know that I have no spoken request tonight but I just pray that you will Minister will work in this and show me what you have me to do. In Jesus' name, I pray. Lord, we love you. And I thank you, Lord, as we come to you tonight. We pray that in your holy name. We thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon us. We thank you, Lord, for answer prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your healing hand. Father, we just pray for those who are sick tonight, Lord, and are hurting. We just pray you be with them in a special way, Lord. Minister to them. Give them peace of mind, Lord, and, and be, be with them always. Now, Father, we, as we go through this evening, we do so praise in your name. And thank you thank for you for all you've done for us. For we thank you most of all, Lord, for your Son Jesus, who died on Calvary for sinners like us. Guide us, direct us, and all that we say and do. Forgive us where we fail you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, 
come and ask us before you. For we know we are sons, Lord, and not worthy. But because of your love, we are saved, Lord. One day we will join you in heaven and thank you for the many, many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Lord, you have blessed this church greatly, and we thank you for that. Now, Lord, we have names that we need to lift up to you. I ask that you lift up Jackie Coleman, Katie Diamond, Camille Good, Good Diane Staley, and I ask that you be with Bud, I ask that you be with Linda Hooker, and Tommy Sue Jones, and I ask that you be with Uncle Roy, Fields, and family, and that you'll continue to be with Aunt Georgia as she continues to heal from her COVID. Lord, there is so much sickness, and we just pray that you will continue to work in this land to control this COVID. And Lord, we pray for all those that are in areas where there's so much rioting and looting and, and problems, Lord. We need you in this country, Lord. We need your, you back where you belong, in our schools and in our homes. Now, Lord, we lift these prayers up to you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. 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 Thank you, Doc, and thank each and every one of you for your prayers tonight. I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 16. We've enjoyed looking at what God was doing in the church of Philippi. We saw the conversion of Lydia, a sweet seller of purple. And we see here the makeup of the church. It's never one type of person. It's all types of people. And tonight we're going to look at a hardened old jailer, keeper of the jail, keeper of the stockade, and how God is going to touch his life. Don't you know he's seen some meanness in his life? Don't you know he's probably experienced and, and, and contributed to some meanness in his life? But when God gets a hold of you, he changes you entirely. We're going to look at verse 16. We'll take up here about uh, a damsel coming to know the Lord and being delivered of the demon that was living in her. And it came to pass, chapter 16, verse 16, and it came to pass as we went to prayer. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Now, you know, divination and telling the future has always been around. Uh, whether you're reading the palm, whether you read tarot cards, or you're casting the sticks, I don't know, however ways people dream, whatever you want to call it, people have always been fascinated by being able to tell the future, or at least interested in learning but that's a dangerous business because we know that it is of the devil. First of all, we know this because every person to a T who ever has found the Lord has lost their ability to tell the future. And I guess it's more curiosity than anything. Uh, and I don't want to know what's going to happen next week. I don't know what will happen next year. Now, if you can find a way to tell the future, you could be a millionaire. You can find out next week's lottery car, uh, the lottery numbers, and you know, go buy it, and then you can just be a millionaire at all. You can read, uh, read the stock market, you know, and you can know what to invest in. And, and it's, it's, I think it's the curiosity of man that causes him to get involved in divination, okay? But always remember, throughout the scriptures, divination is being attributed to the devil. Now, mind you, there's been people who have stood up, folks like Jean Dixon, now she's dead and gone, but she used to attribute her power to God. She said, oh, God gave me this gift. Well, to a T, every person who tries to reveal the future, every psychic reader has always said, well, my gift is of God. But that, however, is contrary to the teaching of the Word of God. Okay? Mm -hmm. You have to understand that. And there's no mix of the two. When Christ comes into a person's heart, they lose the ability to divine what is going to happen in the future. Now, we all kind of like to divvy in that. We all like to read the stories. But I, all the stories that we hear, all the wives' tales we hear about this coming true, that coming true, this person saying they knew God and God gave them this gift, all of those are 
aren't our divider point. All those, the Word of God is our divider and our authority on this. And so we go by what the Word of God teaches, and divination and the Word of God are in a contrary to one another. So if you're going to live for Christ, do not speculate, dive in, whatever you want to, phrase you want to use, into using things that tell the future. Now, you probably, when you were growing up, was introduced to the Ouija board. I was also. And I was fascinated by the Ouija board. It's been used in movies and said, oh, this is a wonderful board. And I don't know if they sell them anymore. I don't ever see them anymore. But the Ouija board was supposed to have the ability to tell the future. Well, curiosity always gets the best of all of us. But remember, those kind of things, tarot cards, Ouija boards, all of those are instruments of Satan. And once you open the door and invite Satan to come into your life, you are playing with fire. Mm -hmm. You are playing with fire. That leads us to our next verse. It came to pass, well, the same followed Paul and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. This did many days, but Paul was grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, Now, he didn't speak to the woman, he spoke to the Spirit. I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Verse 19, And when her master saw that the hope of their games were gone, they called Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace for the, uh, unto the rulers. So that proves that when Christ came into this lady's heart, she lost the ability to tell the future. She lost the ability of divination, okay? Now, it also shows that the, the root of the matter was gain. Uh, whoever was selling her is probably like a circus show going around saying, give us a dime and she'll tell you your fortune or whatever the cost would be. They were making money, but she lost that ability when the spirit left her. Now that brings up another point that I just want to mention in passing. I'm doing this mainly for those who are listening by way of the internet. You've heard me talk about this before. Uh, how many of you believe in demons? Raise your hand. Handful of you, most of you. Most of you believe in demons. Well, if you read the Word of God, you understand that demons are real. Okay? Now, when you see these things, they're sensationalized in the scriptures, but demons do live today. They are in existence. Why do we know that? Because the Bible doesn't say they've ever destroyed. And Paul and Peter both talked about evil spirits. The Bible is full of evil spirits being present in the physical world. We must recognize that fact. You may or may not know that the Catholic Church probably four or five years ago made the decision that they would never practice exorcism again. They believed that some of those things were just superstitions and they just stopped practicing it. However, there are people today who delve into things that they shouldn't delve into and they get to the place where spirits begin to control their lives and they're not good spirits. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's evil spirits. I've only met two people in my life who I presume was demon-possessed. One was a fellow I met at the filling station I worked at when I was a young man, just called to preach, and the other was a fellow in West Virginia. I'm not going to tell those stories over again, but you in your life, maybe you've met somebody, maybe you will meet somebody. Well, when you confront somebody who has an evil spirit, what are you supposed to do? Now, don't say turn tail and run. You see, everybody needs the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how do you exercise a demon out of somebody? You do it the same way that you lead somebody to faith in Christ. You take the Bible, the Holy Word of God, and you use that as a tool. And if you use it correctly, you can help this person be delivered from whatever demon possesses them. Okay? A uh, demon of uh, alcohol, a demon of drugs, a demon of depression, whatever it might be, you can help them. The point is this, the Word of God is authoritative. The Word of God is powerful. If I confronted somebody who I thought was living for Satan, had evil spirits in their lives, I would just simply take the Bible and I'd open it to the Romans road. You say, well, that's so simple. Yes, it is. But here's the key. You start in Romans 1, 16. There is neither, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. We've all sinned 
can come short of the glory of God. And then you walk them through Romans 3.23, Romans 5.7, Romans 6.23, Romans 10.9, and Romans 10.13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you are one-on-one -on -one with somebody who you feel has a spirit of possession, now you don't go around and judge these people, but if they're lost, they're lost. Doesn't matter what control Satan has on them, but here's the key, and listen carefully. You get that person to read the scriptures that we talked about. You said, I want you to read Romans 1, 16. And you let them read it. You let them read it. You let them read Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And listen, if they're willing to read those scriptures, and every time they read a verse, it's making an impression on their life. And when you get to Romans 10, 9, look at there. If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised you from the dead, you can be saved. And if they are willing to read that and you get to the point they're willing to ask Christ to forgive them and come into their lives, you have, you have participated in an exorcism. I mean, believe that. Do you agree with that? Demons are real. Evil spirits are real. But we depend on the word of God. Hey, isn't that what Jesus used when he was in the wilderness and, and Satan came and confronted him? He said, it is written. So we allow the authority of the word of God to do our work in the hearts and lives of unbelievers. And time after time after time, the word of God takes root and the word of God delivers evil spirits. So anyway, this person was delivered of the evil spirit. They lost their ability to bring the master's money. And because of that, the masters got mad. And they said, well, these Jews have come here just to cause us all kinds of trouble. The Jews have been the most persecuted people in the world. Did you know that? If anybody has a right to reparation or whatever, it's the Jews. Because they have been put down. They have spent more time in slavery than in freedom. Okay? They were free for a while, but guess what? Slavery, slavery, slavery. God put them there. God put them there to teach them a lesson. And uh, here... They're blaming the Jews for the trouble. Why you just come here to cause all these kind of problems for us. So they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. See, they're not in a Jewish city anymore. They're, they're in a uh, Gentile city. And the point of that is you just caused all this trouble. And so their Jewish uh, nationality is getting them into trouble. At least they're using that as a backdrop for uh, what they're going to do to them. And they said they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. The multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feast fast in the stock. See, they were in isolation inside. They weren't just in a jail where you, where you kept the general population. They were in the stockade. They were in stocks on the inner side of the prison because they were considered dangerous criminals. Now, why? Well, that had to work that with the hand of Satan. So, uh, pointing to the, uh, the Jews said, well, you know, they really are bad people. We need to keep them locked up and keep an eye on them, okay? So that's the situation for what's about to happen next. What's about to happen next is Philippi is going to get another church member. Now, remember what I told you about the Philippi church. It was the exemplary church of giving. It was an exemplary church of what a Christian church was all about. To know all this, just go read the four chapters in the book of Philippians, and it talks all about how their giving was a sweet savor of the nostrils of God and and how uh, God had blessed them and used them. Well, it all had it started right here. We know two of the first two members. There was Lydia, and there was the old jailer. Now, you know he had to be hard. Anybody worked in the jail, you know, and, and uh, he probably done a lot of mischievous things. But look what was going on at uh, verse 25. At midnight. Now, midnight, everybody's going to be asleep, right? But Paul and Silas was praying and singing praises unto God. The Bible says if we have a merry heart, we're supposed to show it by singing. Okay? 
Now, whether you sing in the shower or whatever you sing, you're supposed to have a song on your heart all the time. Just sing the old hymns. People will just sing them over and over and over again, and they'll bring merriness to your soul. Well, they had been through a rough time. They had been beaten, but they weren't worried about being in jail and, and worried about the body being in aches and pains. They were singing praises unto their God. And here's what happens when, the, when, when people who love God begin to praise God at all opportune times, the Lord blesses. And he says, that the same praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now, so they're witnessing to everybody in the jail, prisoners, and while they were there, they're probably robbers and thieves, maybe some of them murderers. But they hear this. They said, man, these folks got something I've never ever heard or seen before. What kind of religion gives you the ability to praise God in the midst of so much pain and, and hurt? But yet, that's what was going on. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. Now this shows you that God doesn't always use angels to get things done. He uses every resource at his disposal. He can use a storm, an earthquake, a tornado, a hurricane, a COVID virus, uh, an angel. He can use anything that he wants to. Everything is at God's disposal. And there happened just to be an earthquake. Now, how widespread was the earthquake? I have no idea. But I do know that it shook the jail. Because here's what happened. Immediately, the, the prison was shook. And immediately, all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. And so the earthquake just broke all the bands loose. There wasn't no angels there, just the earthquake that shook everything that now the walls let go of all the shackles that were holding the people. Now the keeper of the prison woke out of his sleep. He was a supervisor. He was charged with keeping everybody in the jail and nobody breaking loose. You see, back then, it was just like it is today. Now this was a Roman jail, okay? If anybody would break loose, it would mean his head, okay? The Romans frowned on that. If you lose a prisoner, they're going to kill you. And he woke out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, you know, oh my goodness, everybody's gone. He drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Now, let me tell you something. I've never contemplated suicide, and I don't guess the choices were very much back in those days. But I do believe I could find a better way than falling on the sword. Now, how does that work, actually? I mean, you know, the sword is a long thing. You, I guess you just prop it against the chair and lunge yourself forward on it. It would have to go up under the rib cage to get to the heart. I can think of a lot of better ways to die than that, right? Maybe he was just, I don't know what choice that he had. He wanted to kill himself before the Romans beheaded him because he was, he was letting all the prisoners loose and he was responsible. And so he decided to kill himself. Well, and so he was suicidal. We know that, okay? But look what's going to happen. The Lord is going to come to the rescue. Paul cried with a loud voice, Do thyself no harm. We are all here. But he didn't believe it. He said, The prison gave it Why did y'all left? Because you see, God put them where he wanted them. Always remember this, okay? Wherever a Christian ends up is the place that God wanted them at that time. Now, that's not acceptable to our natural thinking. I mean, if you, God puts you in a, in a hospital bed, an ICU ward, anywhere, he's got you where he wants you. And it's not always necessarily for your benefit. He's put you there to be a minister to others. So Paul and Silas, certainly, they were beat wrongly, thrown in prison wrongly, but they were right where God wanted them. Now that has to, uh, you have to let that sink in, okay? Wherever you are in life and whatever you're going through, you are exactly where God wants you. How do you know that, preacher? Because God is sovereign. And nothing enters our life without his permission. Amen. They would not have ended up in jail if it hadn't been God's will. You say, well, couldn't God have done something else, you know? Yeah, he could. 
But you see, God doesn't explain anything to you and I. He doesn't have to. Can't you imagine God having to explain to a hundred people or a thousand people why he does things? He, he, he wasted all his time. Well, you see, I needed you here because I have been working on this person or this couple for so long, and I've been trying to get them, you know, right with me, and I needed a good, strong, faithful Christian to be at that place at that time to share Christ with them. We're not told anything about the, 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 uh, the Philippian jailer's home life. We don't know what he had gone through, even if, you know, what, what, what was his whole life all about. We don't know where he come from, what he was upbringing was, nothing about it. But just at that particular time, he had a divine appointment with God, and it was Paul and Silas who brought that, that uh, divine appointment together. God wanted to bring the Philippian jailer to the point of conversion, okay? So that's why he's there. That's why the, the Paul and Silas is there. They're there out of the divine appointment of a sovereign God. Well, he called for a light, sprang in, and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. So he said, bring me a light. So somebody brought him a light. And he walking in in fear and trembling. He shaking, shaking under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He says, come over here, come over here, come over here to the light. That's what he says, bring him, come on, come out of the jail. And then he fell on his face and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Friend, let me tell you something. That is the million dollar question. That is the lifelong question that every human being should ask. What do I have to do to be saved? And what was Paul's answer? The same answer that he had given throughout every conversion experience. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, you shall be saved and your house. In other words, whatever home life that the, that the Philippian jailer had, because of his conversion, now there was an opportunity for his house to be converted. There's always a catalyst in every family. There's somebody who is the one that walks with God and has the ability to lead other family members to God. And he's telling him, said, because of your conversion, you're coming believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now your whole family has an opportunity to be saved. Uh, and that's what has to happen. One person coming to Christ has an influence on the whole house. He says, you can be saved and your whole household can be saved. Now, I don't think Paul knew anything about his life, a uh, whole life. But he knew that now that his family could find Christ, if he did. The conversion of our household is one of the most important undertakings we will ever have. Okay? Now, we all have struggles. And we all have uh, disappointments and witnessing to our family. But you see, we never give up. Secondly, when no one ever has the, the, the sincerity or the desire to see the house saved like you do. Certainly, I know all of your family. I love to see them all come to know the Lord, but you know what? I don't have that same desire that you do because they're your blood kin. They're kin to you. So that's why you should earnestly pray and never give up and be that witness in their lives to try to get them to come to know the Lord. Okay. Uh, whatever transpires now, he spoke to him the word of the Lord. Now, so he's telling him about Jesus. He's telling him. Maybe he knew a little bit. Maybe he didn't know anything. Okay. But he's sharing with him Christ. He's spoken to him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. So it's shifted from where the jailhouse was. Now it's came down to where his family is. And he's telling him all about the Lord. He's telling the whole household. And this happens so many times. When one person is saved, the rest of them follow suit. I have seen this happen time after time after time in church. One Two people it's in this church now with a with a child. Uh, the invitation was being given. I can't remember how many years ago, but the wife got up and the husband got up with him. And he told me later, he said, "I thought we was leaving. I thought we was going out." And then she turned to come to the altar, and he came and turned with them, and they both came down and received Christ as Lord and Savior. They both baptized, and they both still in the church is still living for the Lord today. You have that kind of influence. You have that ability to be that 
that person in your family's life. So, 
The Philippi church has basically been started. It looks like they're meeting in the house of Lydia. They have new members. They have the Philippian jailer and his family. And the church is just solidified. And as they, they sat there, they ministered to one another. They comforted one another. And then they said, well, you know, it's time for us to go. We'd love to stay here and bask in God's glory and just talk about His goodness. But we've got other people over yonder in another city that needs to hear the Lord. And that's going to bring us to chapter 17, one of the most powerful chapters of the Word of God. Uh, they visit three cities, and each, each city there's a different experience. But uh, they continue to work, but they fellowship, they found strength and comfort in each other before they left Philippi. And so the church in Philippi has been started. We know two of the members, the jailer, the uh, leather purple, or the or seller purple, and so there it started, and that's what they continue to go in each city, just sharing God's love, doing what they can for the glory of God. Any questions? All right, that's our lesson for tonight. Let's pray together before we go. Lord, tonight I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's true, that it's real. And I ask, Lord, as we walk in your uh, way, that you help us always, dear Father, to have a smile on our face instead of a frown. Help us to understand, Lord, we never know who we're meeting along uh, life's way. And, Lord, that that person might have been prepared by you, just like the Philippian jailer was, to receive a message of goodness. May we not disappoint them, and may we not disappoint you. Help us to be that faithful witness wherever, Lord, we find ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, Amen. You are dismissed.